welcome to you all uh, to be with us uh, today. Uh, we are uh, um, uh, today plan. You are, we are planning to have the talk with Adela Yushich. Uh, she is uh, uh, one of the artists taking part in the exhibition um, that uh, uh, has a title: Stories of Traumatic Past. Uh, counter archives for future memories and uh, um, this uh, show will uh, be open another month in the Welt Museum uh, and we decided to have digitally uh, several talks in this uh, last month with artists uh, in the show. Uh, so, uh, the, um, also maybe to say uh, that uh, uh, the exhibition uh, Stories of Traumatic Past, uh, Counter Archives of Future Memories, uh, uh, is um, a group show. Uh, it was curated uh, uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, Christina Jauernik, uh, Sophie Uitz and me. Uh, we were working as part of a research project uh, that was a basis with the, uh, for this exhibition with the title Genealogy of Amnesia. So what we want to do today? Uh, we want actually to go through a narrative uh, with uh, uh, the artist about the work uh, and uh, uh, we want to actually try to understand uh, through uh, a discourse how to think about the work in the uh, exhibition, um, to give a context to the work, but also to give maybe a bigger view of what is uh, uh, the work uh, uh, bringing to us and which kind of future it is opening. This work by Adela uh, Yushic is done in collaboration with uh, Lana Chmaichanin and uh, Lana Chmaichanin, we uh, can say happily, was with us at the opening of the exhibition, uh, so this time Time we decided with a talk for uh, with Adela Yushic. Um, I would like uh, to, um, to start the talk uh, with uh, um, the short bio of uh, Adela uh, that uh, will give uh, quite an interesting uh, context uh, of uh, uh, how broad is her work. So Adela Yushic was born in 1982 in uh, Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, this is an important uh, moment for us because the show, uh, Stories of Traumatic Past, uh, deals with three regions. One is ex-Yugoslavia, so Bosnia and Herzegovina is central to ex-Yugoslavia. The other is Austria, and the third one is Belgium. Even more, uh, the, uh, the fact that she's coming from Sarajevo and Bosnia and Herzegovina is important for the show because these three territories connect uh, through uh, one central point uh, together, and this is the genocide. Genocides uh, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is connected with Srebrenica, and we will come to this point uh, as it was anti-Semitism, the Nazi time in Austria, uh, the concentration camps and Belgium, uh, Congo and colonialism. So if I go back to Adela Yushic, born in Sarajevo, uh, she graduated from the Academy of Fine Arts, uh, University of Sarajevo in 2007, and in 2013, uh, she also uh, got the MA uh, in uh, Democracy and Human Rights in Southeast Europe uh, from Sarajevo and Bologna universities. Uh, the projects uh, that uh, uh, artistic work that was done um, in uh, the past decades by Adela Yushic, uh, it's very ample. Uh, the exhibitions are uh, more than 100 international projects uh, all around the world, from Germany to Spain uh, to uh, Paris and so on. Um, uh, she also was a resident of 
many workshops, uh, also many uh, uh, conferences. She took part, got uh, several very important uh, awards uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the region from which, uh, from where she is coming. And uh, uh, maybe uh, to say that uh, um, uh, for, from 2010 to 2019 uh, was very important uh, her work uh, inside the Association for Culture and Art with the title Cervena, that means red. She was the co-founder and she also ran this very important place uh, uh, for art, uh, cultural activities, feminist discourses and so on. This also is a touch and with this I finish uh, with the online archive of for anti-fascist struggle of women of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Yugoslavia. This is telling, I think, uh, quite uh, uh, in a very broad way uh, what uh, is the work, what is the context of uh, Adela Jusic. And uh, if we go now to the work, I would like maybe uh, before uh, asking the first question uh, to uh, uh, show um, Uh, I would like to uh, show uh, one of the screen, uh, Adela Jusic. I hope you can see. Uh, yes, the, you can. Yes, uh, super. Uh, so, um, I want to go to the uh, uh, to the data. So the title of the work is Bedtime Stories. It's a six uh, channel sound installation. And uh, the departure of this uh, six channel sound installation, it's actually this uh, photograph that you can see. Uh, this is a photograph of the basement of a residential building in Sarajevo that was used as a shelter during the siege of Sarajevo in the 90s, because the topic of the work by Adela and Lana is actually the 90s, uh, the siege of Sarajevo uh, by the paramilitary forces of Serbia, and uh, also uh, it's connected with the war that was going on in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the 90s. Uh, this is the starting point, but uh, uh, what is the presentation in the space of the World Museum for those who are taking part and want now to listen to Adela, uh, this is the installation. Uh, the sound, uh, 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 the project, the sound the narratives uh, are presented at the sound installation uh, without images, uh, but uh, actually the narratives uh, that we can listen are uh, giving us uh, the context and bringing us back in the 90s. Uh, saying this, uh, I also would like to uh, say that uh, the work uh, had many different uh, uh, ways of presentation. We will talk about this. I just briefly uh, show some of uh, the images for, from past presentation uh, in different settings, in different exhibitions exhibition spaces in different cities. For example, this one was in Slovenia, in Maribor in 2012, and this one is actually uh, the presentations that was done in uh, Stockholm in Sweden in 2011. So with this, uh, I um, uh, stop uh, sharing uh, uh, and uh, I go back uh, uh, to uh, Adela. So Adela, uh, if we uh, go from uh, that moment uh, that was uh, key uh, for uh, your work with uh, Alana in uh, making the six channel sound installation, can you tell us what was actually the 90s? What meant uh, to take a shelter in the basement while the city was under siege? Uh, and what kind of narratives 
are uh, presented then from that time in the show in the World Museum. Uh, okay, first of all, hello everybody. Thank you, Marina, Sophie, everybody's nice to see you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, was, I'm very happy to participate in this like very long, long, long project with this old great uh, following side activities, but also big ones such as a book, the catalog and the exhibition, which were not unfortunately be able to present there due to the all these extraordinary COVID situations. But however, you made it and here we are, even trying to do the art talks and it works. So we're adapting. Yes, so um, I'll just uh, have my um, short reminder so I will not share the screen with you, but just in case, because this work really went through many, uh, uh, many phases so far. It started together with me and Lana researching in like 2011. Uh, started as, um, as 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 somehow it was a it was a normal response because we realized, um, having in mind that most of my work are uh, actually based on the personal experiences of war, or at least some experience which which I am I was at least partially part of. Uh, personal tragedies, you know, internal refugee uh, situations and all this, uh, for example, childhood spent in basement. So we realized that the whole generation we have and all of our friends have gone through this um, basement uh, lockdown for, for four years of the of this longest siege uh, uh, in, the, in the contemporary period. So, and then we were just in the regular conversation hearing all the time uh, the other few people and friends talks of, of our generations and a bit all, older of those experiences. And since so it was already mine and Lana's subject, we decided uh, let's try to start to collect interviews uh, to see because some of the stories were really, let's say, uh, tragical stories about those part of lives. But sometimes were just it was just stories about regular growing up, but just with different types of games and different types of entertainment and different extraordinary conditions, you know. But childhood was still going on, you know. And we talked about our childhood, but always in the environment of the basement. So mm, we thought about uh, the interviews and then we started collecting them. It was much more than six. And those six we decided for because um, they were somehow different emotional and uh, I don't know, even in the structure, some were poetry, some were told to us, some in the form of interviews, some were just written to us, some were already previously written um, poetical stories, I mean, um, poems, let's say. And we decided to have these uh, several different approaches, so not only interviews, but also these testimonials, interviews, uh, transcriptions, writings, uh, and us kind of six different uh, emotions to produce in all those stories. So some of the interviews, let's say, are funny, if you can say stuff like that, but are really child, child, childhood memories of any regular childhood. If they were not happening in the basement, they could still, you know, work as, as a child. So it were happening in the basement. So that reminds us it's, it is an extraordinary situation of life and death. And out of those interviews, yeah, we selected those six. And then the first production happened in Stockholm, thanks to Vlada Niremic and this great exhibition, Farg Fabriken. And that is the first time when we actually saw the work. Mm, I can, if you want, maybe share the screen, but it's not so necessary. But however, first time it was produced as a form, in the form of uh, six replicas of those six basement rooms. So most of these uh, big socialist buildings, they had these, their own private um, small um, storages in the basement. Every apartment has their own, where you would usually keep the old stuff, you know, which you don't want to have uh, uh, um, in, in the apartment. And they were locked in some wooden war, you know, doors or some just like, um, how do you call it, like a jail, uh, you know, wooden things. We call it Shupa in Bosnia. I don't know the, num the, the English in... Uh, I don't know the English expression, storage in a way, but in a socialist building storage. And there were 62 of those storages in a big 62 apartments um, 
uh, uh, socialist building. And then, of course, when the war started, we all started to sleep there. Instead of the storages, we emptied and then we created sleeping rooms because this was the only safe environment. You know, when the grenades would start to fall, we would go first, like in some safe areas of the apartment, if there were some, because I lived on the eighth floor, it depends on which side the grenade uh, attack is coming from. Some parts of the house were important, some important of the apartment were safe. Most of them were not. We sometimes slept under the window, you know, because of, of our newly uh, uh, learned ballistic uh, experiences. You know, if you sleep under the window, then, the, you know, some bullets cannot come in because you're just under the window. They usually strike not through the walls, but through the window. Window. So, however, and then we started to going out in the front of the buildings, you know, there was a second phase if the grenades, uh, you know, attack starts to be really serious. So we, we were sleeping inside of these uh, building uh, house, or how they call it, like uh, where the stairs are, which had no windows. So that, that was much more safe area. But if the real attack starts, and which, which happened a lot, then we started really uh, going down the basin, running, everybody starting to go there, uh, down the basin, where we finally formed our sleeping rooms in those storages and of course our kids we were really bored um, the old people were just uh, trying to listen to some radio in some improvised you know bicycle production of electricity and everything to see because when you're under the siege you know you do not know what the, what is going on outside you know maybe the, the aggressors forces are already you know next to the city maybe it's just about you know it's it's about time and one hour or two if, if we really are already you know convicted if we, they're all just going to enter the city you know if you don't know what's going on in the rest of the state and how is the military forces uh, actually moving and the power in between them, you know, what's going on. It was really sad. It was quite cut off, you know, from news and everything in, in a sense that there was no electricity and that, that was actually the main, main point of the, of the aggressors from the hills to make us really afraid and not to know and to cut us out of the world, which actually they did, you know, to cut the electricity, to cut the water supplies, you know, cut the food and everything. And then to, you know, attack us with all those useful National Army weaponry that they had on the hills and just to kill as much as more civilians and, you know, to destroy the city and conquer the city. So, you know, in those basins, everybody, all the old people and young, you know, they were really panicking. But our generation really, were, we, we really did not understand what is the, what is the real, uh, um, let's say, uh, is, how, how serious that is. And uh, how, we, because we could not be afraid in that age from 10 to 14. So we really just wanted to have a regular childhood, you know, to, you know, run around, play guitars, you know, um, do different things. And everybody was just telling us the old, older people, sh sh you know, sh so basically these part of the rooms, we used to sleep like several of us children, the replica from S Stockholm, you saw, it's just the replica of that size of the rooms with those improvised beds with those six right across each other. So three rooms right across three and three across. And then inside of those were the integrated speakers where you could hear those six different stories, which we also made, um, we designed music with, with some uh, musical music producer, each uh, for each uh, story specific music. I mean, not music, but you know, something to follow the emotion and the narrative, different kinds of uh, emotional narratives. As I said, some funny, some very serious, uh, and and you know, with with emotional emotions of fear or emotions of uh, you know totally being lost and. And then uh, that was the first production in Stockholm. And then very soon later, we had to do one in Maribor. For that one, we really, you know, did not have, of course, a lot of money. But luckily, we had a real basement in one of the galleries, which exactly, I don't know, somehow, it looked very much like those big common rooms in, in the middle of the basement. So we just put a lot of mattresses on the floor. And then it was even more... Uh, uh, let's say convenient, I mean, not convenient, but like convincing because that really made a replica of, of this, uh, real, you know, the beds on the floor and mattresses and a uh, basement destroyed was maybe a little bit working in a different sense in, in this case, looking more like a basement. But in the first case, we had uh, the idea was to make an audience in Stockholm to be able to uh, lie down, you know, in that uh, beautiful small uh, uh, mattresses inside of those rooms, even two people together, and then to listen to the narrator, which talked uh, in English, of course, uh, with his very calm down voice. Um, 
saying uh, saying it like a bedtime story. It's like so you're able to relax and fall asleep there, even you know in the gallery, but still you're listening to the story of the real children from the basement, which at one point makes you really inconvenient because there is also music following the beautiful narrator's voice, like a bedtime stories. You know, <laughs> you're able to sleep, but you're not counting that the the content of the story will actually be something more serious. And those are not the bedtime stories of the regular children, but the bedtime stories of children who are growing up in war. And there's, you know, always th thousands and hundreds of thousands around the world at every time, at every point that are going through many worse, maybe, uh, situations. Can, can I interrupt you? Uh, of course, because please. you point to this uh, interesting uh, um, element uh, inside uh, uh, how you use, uh, how you work with the sound. Uh, and this is uh, something that is uh, um, uh, very present in your installation. So you have two levels of sound. Uh, one uh, sound is for those who can understand is uh, uh, those who are speaking, they are speaking in Bosnian language and they are uh, 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 yes. telling us with the music, it's really uh, very uh, performative. But then it's this uh, English uh, translation that is so tranquil, monotone, uh, just like a kind of really make you almost uh, that you will go to sleep. And I was uh, thinking, could you explain, because it's uh, obviously uh, very artificially constructed and yes, very sir. effective. Deliberately, right? yes. Yeah. Why yeah. you did in such um, a way? Be because we were thinking, you know, we have we have two versions of this work. One is uh, made for the representations in the local countries, you know. For example, Zagreb, uh, Belgrade, Bosnia. There is no English version. We just use uh, roughly edited Bosnian versions of testimonials. But when we exhibited in the Western countries, where most of the people really didn't go through, you know, the war, even Croatians went through the war, you know, Bosnians did. We can, you know, we wanted in Bosnia, specifically in historic museum to have both versions, one for the tourists, because the work was commissioned in the Bosnian Historic History Museum as part of the bigger project. Uh, though we created only three rooms, not six, because there was really not space. And then we put two stories in each. There we put both versions, one with English and Bosnian and an, like combined, intervenes, and another one only with Bosnians, you know, Bosnian language for the people who are local, you know. But the thing is, there was this like, it was a little bit of irony. We needed this uh, very calm voice um, in English to tell it to the people who never lived through it, you know, to give an irony because there's been years of war here and in the region and people all around the world were blind to it as they were blind in many, in many countries, you know, at the same time. So this um, very calm bedtime stories, narrator's voice is created for um, them to feel a little bit, you know, this uncomfortable thing. You have this nice voice narrating, but at the same time, you know, there is this uh, Bosnian, Bosnian uh, language uh, parts intervening to remind you that and, and they are like created to be to sound like they're somewhere from coming from this distant radio. You know, because this is the news, you know, how they, you know, receive the news. There is something over there happening, you know, in that some local language, you know, which they do not understand, you know. So you have all of a sudden Bosnian interruption to in this editing to say uh, that it is somewhere there in this very far, far away, but not so far away, uh, the country in the middle, actually, of, again, in Europe. Then there is some war happening over there, you know. So this was a little bit of irony created for for the audience that was living somewhere else and did not. How we perceive the war when you hear, not we, but millions of people. When you hear war is going on somewhere else, it's always some, it's far away, you know, even if it's in Bosnia. And this is how the international community actually perceived the war here. M many, most of the people did not understand what is happening here and what, what hard times are people going through, you know, the, through the whole Bosnia, not only Sarajevo under the siege, the genocide is happening. So this was a kind of irony that was trying to say, okay, now you have it presented in a bedtime stories form, but then you hear this really real time people, real people's voice in foreign language saying the same thing 
from time to time, reminding you on all these media information and something you do not take so seriously because it's happening somewhere else. And this is what really is the case when, when, the, when it comes up to war, you know. Mm -hmm. When you say, you bring us actually um, uh, in a certain, through your way of uh, explaining uh, um, uh, also to this uh, point uh, uh, that is central, as I said in the beginning, to the whole idea of the show, how to connect three different territories. And this is the genocide in many formats, but the genocide is the genocide. And uh, in 2020 is uh, um, the 25th anniversary of the genocide in Srebrenica and uh, um, this was a big struggle to be recognized as such. Uh, it was an important battle by the murder of Srebrenica and I think uh, uh, it's very appropriate to ask you uh, because of your work, of your uh, um, uh, thinking and uh, contextualization, how you see uh, from uh, today's point of view uh, uh, and you think about uh, uh, 1995, uh, looking back, the Srebrenica genocide, the impact yeah. on your work in I, the yeah. region. I will tell you maybe something which is not the, the, the nicest uh, thing to talk about. But as a child, I have actually very traumatic experience about 1995 and Bosnia and Srebrenica people coming here. You know, we have all these stories now that Bosnia was sold by the political top, in, you know, to just give one part of the B Bosnia Srebrenica, you know, the Srebrenica was sold. Basically, okay, we give this to, to Serb paramilitary forces. And then, and, you know, there's a lot of these um, uh, uh, theories that Bosnia was actually given an exchange, you know, for parts of Sarajevo and things like that. Many things that people in Bosnia, the soldiers and army and all this from Srebrenica are actually you know, um, really disappointed uh, by the top of the government. You know, there are different theories of conspiracy, which I, some of them I really believe. The Srebrenica was actually, uh, Srebrenica was actually um, uh, given as a, let's say, um, sacrificed, you know, sacrificed, basically, okay, there you go, guys, take Srebrenica. They didn't fight for that. People, some think, uh, Bosnian top, political top, they didn't fight for it so much. And there is also the partial, you know, political, you know, malversation inside of it. But of course, nobody expected that the genocide will happen. However, even though if you give the territory and you know, say okay, we don't maybe need evidence, but nobody expected they're gonna kill that many people because they're doing forces over there. And you know, even if it happened, you know, there is still a huge responsibility to those who were there and everything. But I remember very um, as a child, I was now so 13. And I was living in the center of Sarajevo. We already were also, of course, in the middle of the war. We didn't, you know, we didn't have many hopes. I already left. It was very, very pessimistic period because it was already three years of siege. And it was really, I did, it didn't look like it's going to end up very soon. We never, never trust all those short peace agreements and everything because they were always interrupted by, you know, gun fights, grenade attacks and everything. So we didn't believe to anybody anymore. We didn't believe it's going to stop at all. But then there was a huge wave of uh, refugees coming to, as a child, I remember when 13 came to Bosnia, to Sarajevo especially. And having them, you know, they were rural area people, you know, so they started to come to Sarajevo and they were, you know, coming into some empty departments, you know, who were deserted by the people who were directly, of course, also included into the, Siege of Sarajevo, you know, would, you know, apartments where you could find a lot of weapons and all those who knew that the war is going, you know, the uh, military officers, you know, they were connectly, um, connected to the uh, SDS, the Serb Democrat, you know, the party, the, the, the Serb uh, Nationalist Party. So, but they were coming from very rural area. And I remember Sarajevo did not ex accept them. I mean, that is also something that nobody talks about. Sarajevo did not really respond a lot greatly to this uh, uh, Srebrenica refugees coming in, you know, people were making even jokes because uh, on this, because they they did not know also what was going on in Srebrenica at the time very well. Later, we all got familiar with all the atrocities and everything. But, you know, these people came from rural, rural areas and they, you know, they just, uh, I think the Sarajev urban people were like really bothered by all of this sudden coming of this rural area, only women and their children, you know. 
um, later, of course, people understood the atrocities and then, you know, things have changed a lot. But my first encounter with going to Srebrenica was, I don't know how many years ago, I really avoided to go there. I wasn't ready and I never did the work on the, on the subject of the genocide in Srebrenica because it did not feel somehow ethically, how to say, yeah, the, you know invited, you know, because I, it wasn't part of it. For me, it's very important to understand the experience in such an intimate level and personal. So since I didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, experience with it, I did not uh, go through that subject yet, although I will soon, I will tell it to you. But um, when I went to Srebrenica, first for some big panel, you know, over there, which also give the interview in a genealogy of the amnesia book. Uh, partially it was there, uh, some parts we... Mm, we skipped out, but, you know, I went there and there was this panel by some PhDs and everything about the memories and war and the atrocities and genocide. My first impression when I came there, there was this girl running and making jogging around the fabric factory of accumulators. For me, it was, you know, too much, you know, I wasn't prepared to even see the, 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 the factory where everybody was slaughtered. But then also, you know, right next to the factory, there was a lunch organized for people, you know, by some international organizers, though. However, you know, very much also um, victim families were victims of the genocide. But still, it was a little bit strange because, you know, you have the museum and then next to it you have a place for lunch and where people eat were the, you know, high resolution photographs with all the atrocities. So we had lunch in space where next to you while you're eating, you're watching the uh, uh, high, high rest resolutions of the dead bodies and everything. And all those international community PhDs and everybody working on genocide were actually having lunch there every day. And they said like, like how can you eat in this space? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, I mean, you, they're used to it already in the second or third day. I really wanted to just like throw up and we got out. And well, for me, it was... Uh, I don't know, you know, maybe it was, it was very, very uh, unpleasant experience. I never went back to Srebrenica after that. And I don't feel like going there a lot, but I will probably mostly pro probably do because we are trying now to do one, let's say, international collaboration with some people from Netherlands who are working on atrocities and with Medica Zenz and some Bosnian artists and the organizations who want to do this big project, one year project on the massive rape and the systemic rape, mass rape in Srebrenica and all the others. And I have a lot of friends. This is very, um, I mean, private thing, and but it's always great to speak through these like private experiences and first person who were born basically in these factories of, 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 of um, accumulators there. Uh, 1992, you know, who lost all their male families, male, male uh, members of family. I can tell you this. These young children are the least nationalist that I know of, you know. They make uh, the darkest jokes based on the uh, on what they went through, the darkest jokes on genocide. And they don't care about nationalism so much because they were betrayed by most of the organizations and uh, parties and uh, I'll say led advocates here when it comes to genocide. And, you know, even the last work of Yasin Lajbanic was criticized. Like, how long are you going to profit on the genocide, everything else? Though I heard all the best that it is the, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen it, unfortunately, yet. But you, you mean know, the, the film uh, Quo Vadis Saida? Exactly, yes. That is, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it. Yes, so there's people now saying, like, until when are you going to exploit the subject of genocide and this and that and, and get money? Do I heard that she did really a good work? I have to see it yet. But the thing is that um, the subject is still important and it still needs to be internationally, you know, still prom prom promoted. But, you know, to, to become to become national awareness as you did through your own project also, thank you very much. But it is a subject that needs to be treated properly and still needs to be, you know, represented properly because it's been abused 
here and in the region, the Republic of Srpska and Serbia, and it's still brought into question, you know, if the genocide happened or not, you know. So still it must be solved, though the um, International Court, of, you know, ICTY and everybody did not, you know, really, really did the proper job, as far as I think. Spent uh, like millions on new euros, but, you know, we don't have a lot of convicted people. Okay, everything is still going on, but... The question of genocide will stay for a very, very long time, an important, crucial question, which we, if we don't make a consensus in between both, you know, Republic of Srpska and or the whole Balkans, I mean, of what really happened there, it will still be, have to, have to be, it's our obligation to examine it and to go through it, in, in a, you know, and to exam, examine it objectively and to, you know, really work legally on, on, on the issues that of, of things that happened over there. Okay, I have a, a point that you open and also I, I wanted to ask you, and this is the question about the form. I think you point very uh, well um, uh, the, um, that it's uh, an important content, but then it's always when you make a work, you have to make a decision. And uh, for me, it was very interesting uh, also what you, uh, and painful to listen actually, uh, this experience in Srebrenica a few years ago, uh, when you also said about the images and the being there and so on. And I always ask myself, uh, um, uh, if you think uh, that uh, the decision for a sound uh, is a very powerful way of uh, uh, interpolating the uh, audience, uh, the visitor, okay. Uh, is actually uh, something uh, uh, that was uh, more suitable in your um, thinking for a uh, talking about the war, the atrocities, then, for example, let's say documentary images uh, in this concrete case, if yes. it is from that time. How do you see this relation as an artist? Yes. Because it's really, you know, if if you have, if you, you have, you have, don't have. I mean, you have uh, narrative, you have audio, you have video. As an artist, you have photographs. I mean, you have images, then you have the sound or testimony, the written word, right? You can, of course, do the performance and everything else. But in this case, I mean, avoiding images are really <laughs> too explicit. Images of violence are hard to use in in some kind of ethical way, not to re-traumatize. First of all, myself. Second of all, you know. Uh, at the audience, nobody want to watch the dead bodies, you know, it's, but still, I think that that's why the narration really is suitable. And that's why maybe playing with this, uh, you know, narration that is nice and, you know, puts you to sleep and everything else in this environment or whatever. And these uh, actual stories, which are, uh, 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 um, you know, not, not so convenient. At least some of them are, some of them are funny. But to, you know, explain, explain the environment in the basement. But I also like, and I think it's important to play with the space. Because spaces of trauma and spaces, environments of those are not so explicit in, a, in, for, in, a, in a terms of like shows, showing the violence. But they can still explain you, you know, the, the ways of living, all those small spaces of, of the storages where you slept. It can give you the atmosphere of how hard how many square meters you actually had to put several people in that hiding areas or the explicit image of, of the Maribor or the, the military beds that we use in Zagreb in the big exhibition, you know, uh, surrounding this big circle, you know, with all this, so you can sit also on the, on the military bed and then the, to, I mean, of course it's important, you know, but I also think it by showing the absence of violence, you can also say a lot about violence and the narratives and testimonials and, and, you know, playing with the forms, as we said, some bedtime stories form, which is, you know, um, some contrast to what actually is happening. You can still, even without showing the explicit forms of and, and visuals or violence, still really get to the audience and, you know, provoke some thinking, rethinking emotions. Uh, uh, and you know, empathy, understanding, uh, or even, even um, you know, uh, make for, you know, pro make them uh, go and research furthermore, or think about it, or you know, it will stay in their in their heads. I think, in in any of those setup, even in yours in Wealth Museum, I think it's also very very well done. You have the sound, you have the text; it's very readable. It's very, it's all over there. 
I don't think that audience as much as we had because of the due to COVID times and everything is going wrong. I still think that the audience can really feel it, you know, that they can understand. It is not so violent. Is not, violence is not there. It's not explicit. It's not direct. But I think still the uh, emotion and the empathy and everything else is there. You know, you can still understand the children talking. You can still understand what was going on. So actually, it was very... Um, great that we went through all these different forms where we had to adapt, either due to the budget, either due to the space, either due to the, you know, some other, you know, uh, limitations, which most of our exhibitions have. We don't go to produce like a million, million uh, costs, uh, like uh, uh, works, you know, it's not a production of, of you know, Marina Abramovic or whoever, you know, it is the production, lower budget production, which I have no problem with, because I think, you know, uh, also us as an artist, we shouldn't spend, you know, that much. We don't need that much to really um, make work which is uh, valuable and which can really work with the audience. Or one, yeah, one of uh, the elements that, again, uh, it's uh, coming from uh, the way how you explain to us, and thank you very much, it's really interesting, uh, the elements that you bring also relations to space goes for me performativity. Uh, because uh, uh, when I remember one of the images, uh, uh, this uh, theater uh, context, uh, uh, because these narrations could be uh, also narrated uh, live. That means uh, uh, really uh, have uh, actors who uh, follow uh, that uh, uh, important text because the text is there uh, and we uh, can uh, think through what is said. All these experiences of recollecting uh, when somebody is saying, I was young, I, do, I don't know what I was actually thinking. For me was, as you said in the beginning, we, we didn't know exactly it was a horrible times, but as a child, you perceive this in a different way. Uh, so uh, um, saying this, uh, um, uh, I thought also when I saw the installation in the Museum of Revolution in Sarajevo, uh, where you uh, have the work uh, presented, um, I, I found uh, very suggestive uh, the idea to, to have like uh, some reconstruction of the basement and then yeah. actually to be forced to enter that space in an absolute dark. And that is very like, because yeah. in the History Museum, that is the first time that where um, any Bosnian public institution has commissioned the work of contemporary artists in a while, you know, because we don't have the Contemporary Art Museum, we don't have any of those, but we had luckily the History Museum, and they have this uh, Sarajevo under the siege permanent setup, which has made all of those, all these objects from war, like ovens, kitchen, so you have a kitchen from war, you have a dining, you know, you have all these ovens, you have how, the, the, the things, you have like how did we produce electricity? Then you have some visual materials, documents. So in that form of this very um, sub artifact setup of how did we manage through the war having to be able to survive in the house uh, or in the living room or in the, you know, in the, you know, how to heat, how to make water. So all those objects that we uh, uh, creatively created to be able to survive at those uh, very horrible times. And then uh, when we applied, I really knew it's going to um, work because they did not have the basement sleeping rooms part. And accidentally, the work was already produced before that. And they did not have any of the audio, uh, you know, so they only had like objects and written things. And luckily it was commissioned. So this is the only um, commissioned work in, in the whole history museum or I mean in any museum these, 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 these past 10, 15 years, because nobody commissioned uh, contemporary art works. And it's first perfectly fits the, the their setup, although it's a very low budget setup, of course, and uh, it was also to help with the Royal College of Art and some British other institutions. But still, even them, they did not have a lot of money. But still, you know, we, uh, History Museum is in a very hard condition, as all the institutions of culture in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Sarajevo also. And um, 
I mean, we did name again for the huge production. This time in Scotland, in, in Stockholm, it was like Sweden. Okay, they had enough money, you know, but even the workers, they cost more than the whole installation. <laughs> but however, you know, um, in, in the History Museum, you again adapted. Okay, so, yeah, so we said we're going to do two, two, three rooms, not six. We're going to try to make it smaller and to be adaptive, but still to fit because really now you have, so you have dining room, living room, kitchen, all the objects, elements, and then you have uh the, the 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 basement sleeping rooms so it fits perfectly and i'm very proud it's part of this collection because it really belongs there and then most of the foreigners and tourists and everybody when they come to bosnia sarevo sorry they go to see the sarevo under the siege and there is only one contemporary artwork over there that is ours and i'm very proud of it i'm also very proud of it. it's part of this exhibition because i think really think it belongs there and belongs to the whole project um yeah thank you for yeah. inviting us Yes, I will yeah. maybe ask you now uh, uh, the last question and then we open for uh, if it's a question and answer. I have some, but uh, um, we cannot, uh, of course, uh, uh, as is said uh, by words, uh, uh, recuperate all your uh, works uh, and history of your work. That is uh, what uh, I know really um, very precise, I must say, and continues to go back to uh, the space of Bosnia Herzegovina uh, from the night is on, but uh, really works with a form. And I think this is uh, uh, fantastic because uh, uh, the brutality of the narrative, uh, you always search the ways how you uh, show to us and always surprise us or in a collaborative project like this yeah. one or in your personal and i would like actually um uh, to ask you maybe finally uh, first uh, what is your next project but also if you could uh, maybe uh, give us briefly some ideas of your ways of working because i remember projects that were um tremendously important like when you made the work uh, uh, when your father died as a sniper uh, and uh, this work uh, uh, that was done in the past 2007. yes uh, that is really a historical work was also uh, uh, feeling uh, in the western context i must say the people who felt very pleasant and very disturbed locally was very politically criticized even really yes. so i would like if you can just give us now a wider uh, context uh, of your work uh, uh, briefly of course uh, oh, you uh, mean the general of my work or that work or the work, last... but also what you want to uh, do because you talk uh, that you will work on this uh, uh, case uh, that is another tremendous effect of the war it's a rape Actually, uh, yeah. brutality until the end, and uh, uh, maybe how you plan to enter such a topic. Uh, yeah, I this is uh, maybe. I mean, the, sni the sniper was really the most shown and most reproduced, rep represented work in the whole world. I think so far it was in. Can, can you give us briefly the content? What was the work about? So basically, it was a very thing. simple 2007 work. At the time, I did not really know what was going on in the international scene. It was one of my first videos. Uh, let's say video performance. I did not even think about entering the international scene, or I didn't even know what the, what does the international scene of art, contemporary art, does mean, because I was quite young, and we, we were here quite... Uh, uh, let's say isolated from from all those uh, happenings and everything. I was yeah, quite young and I didn't travel a lot. I didn't have a lot of experience. Okay, we used, started using internet a lot, but we still I did not understand what is the contemporary art world in in, in Europe or, or or further even. And and uh, I wasn't ready for all the bad stuff and the good stuff that can happen and all this. Uh, uh, curatorial, uh, let's say, uh, shallow works that can be done or um, uh, abuse of uh, works in certain different political, uh, uh, you know, uh, agendas and everything. So that work was... Um, quite intimate. I didn't know what's going to happen. I, I, I def certainly did not know it's going to become so popular. It was my own experimentation. So was, I mean, almost recorded by myself and a friend, edited by myself first time. I did not have any of those skills because I went to very classical academy. So, but then somehow that was the work which helped me reach the international audience. 
because it was a work of the personal tragedy, but it was a very um, um, anti-military work. It did explain my statement, who were the aggressors and everything else, and that my father was part of the anti-sniper unit who got shot right after the, who got shot at the beginning of the war as a very young soldier with 33. Um, and the work was using just two simple things. One hand of me drawing a And circle. he was a part of the Bosnian uh, unit. Bosnian army, Sarajevo, sieged by anti-military force, anti-sniper forces. So his task was to kill the snipers, no? Who were targeting civilians, first of all. And uh, I mean, not only this, but, you know, he was in part of every important uh, military action in the defense of Sarah. It was just the beginning of the war where the army had no soldiers and had no weapons and just started to collect the army, especially no weapons to fighting all these uh, huge uh, Yugoslav National Army weaponry, which was all around the hills. So it was war against civilians, as we all know it in Sarah. It was definitely war against the civilians, you know especially you no know, to be part of the anti-sniper, you know, it is nothing to, you know, be ashamed. My father did definitely not kill the civilians, but was in charge to kill the snipers. And then there was this huge also, yeah, we wanted to go to the, um, maybe it would be more interesting to go and share screen for this big exhibition of stealth. Do you want me to do this? Okay, so after some years of uh, Sniper being very popular and exhibited all around the world, abused in many shallow and horrible uh, curatorial concepts, which was, I, as a young artist, a lot, was not aware it is possible, and everything else, I felt like sometimes like an exotic animal. It was like, oh, okay, come these Bosnians. Uh, okay, come wars, popular now, Yugoslav wars, let's do that. Some of the, now I know how to reject bad proposals and projects from cura curators. But at the time I was, I just wanted really to be part of the contemporary art world. I did not understand how um, unethical it, it can actually be. And um, later when I continued working, I did this uh, several other works. And then some years ago, me and um, Peter Tomas Dobrila from uh, Maribor, Kibla, the, the uh, cultural work of curator, he realized, we realized that we want to make a solo exhibition and we realized that we have actually, that I have six, seven works on sniping, but on many different, uh, from many different discourses. So we made this exhibition called Stealth. Maybe you can show us uh, if you can. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. This I'm going to now um, uh, share the screen with you. Just let me first find it. All right, it was here. Oh, no, it's here. Okay, and then share screen is still. Done. Share screen is here. Here, and then uh, one participant can share at the time. So somebody may, maybe has it something on because I cannot share my screen. Oh yes, I can. Here it is. Yes, you can. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so it's photos. Okay, so there's just I, maybe 20 photos. This is the, um, I just need to minimize you. Yes, very right. good. We, so this is the beginning. See. So basically, it is. Um, I realized I have five, six, seven works from different discourses about sniping. I wasn't even aware of it, you know? And so he made the works only about that. Stealth is this, you know, where you, you have to, you know, stealth, you know what is stealth in English. I don't know now even how to say it in Bosnian. So, okay, I included all my works there about this. So this is the... Hunizdrnč, it is my uh, very, they're very simple single channel videos where uh, with very simple uh, video performances in one shot, mostly. And some YouTube materials I was able to find and uh, to connect together where I wanted to have all these positions, position of a sniper from this side, position of a sniping, position of a victim, position of people of other generations later and everything. Uh, so, because, you know, snipers were really a massive, you know, immersive problem, huge problem in Sarajevo, you know, this is what we were all, all afraid of the whole time of the siege. They were our, you know, uh, biggest enemies, you know, to go to get a water or supplies, you know, because they enabled, dis enabled, disabled the whole movement around the city. They made us really stuck and 
possible to go and get anything, supplies, woods, visit, go nothing, movement, you know, completely limit the movement. So this is the sniper work where I'm drawing this circle and the image, image of my father, just one image, the only one I have appears. And then there is this reading from his notebook about the uh, soldiers that he killed by dates, which I found when he died. And then in the end, just a very simple sentence, like my father, the sniper, was shot in a, uh, by the sniper that, on the 3rd of December, and that's it. So very open, you know, to, unfortunately, too many political abuse and everything, but still it is a kind of, let's say, anti-military, uh, um, anti-war, you know, uh, a kind of work. Even though it is very personal experience, it gives you the picture, you know, when you, when you hear that the victims were killed, like, of, in every day, but when you see a face of a person who actually died and you're related to the artist, there comes this feeling, you know, so you don't understand the victims as numbers, but you ex understand them as they have a face, and then they are related to the artist or whoever, it's a personal experience, then you stop, then you don't care anymore, who, where does he come from, <laughs> what did he do? Uh, okay, still limiting myself that there were no civilians that he targeted because we were the civilians targeted here. But however, you know, um, and then another video where I'm actually cleaning the M48 gun sniper, which was one of the experiences my father taught me how to clean it when I was 10. Uh, so it is a kind of a repeating a video performance of me shooting the exact same M48, which was held under my house even after the war, you know, we didn't give it back. But it's really an old shotgun from 40, you know, from, from Second World War. Uh, because it's interesting that the fathers uh, taught their children with 10 years old, even the girls, to clean the weapons, you know. I mean, it's not really a normal childhood, as, as the bedtime stories also says, you know, in all those stories. I was just a part of the opening, I'm sorry, the stealth movement. And this was a critique to a video game, Sniper Ghost Warrior, which I did... Um, created in uh, 2011. Sniper Ghost Warriors is like a, a Polish company for the American um, American um, buyers or whoever, the children, but also the children in Bosnia and Balkan were playing. So basically, the soldiers and the army set up, the video game is set up in Siege Sarajevo, and then the UN and Americans are saving us from the from Ratko Mladic and they stopped the genocide. They killed Ratko Mladic and everything is fine. You know, historical corrective, mm -hmm. really historical collective. Of course, it never happened. What struck me with this game, why I wanted to actually use it is that this soldier at one point, you hit him in the eye and my father was hit in the eye. So when I was watching the game the first time, I was really like, yeah, I mean, are you really doing this to us? Are you really setting up a real video game in the real wartime environment where the Americans are saving us? Come on. I mean, uh, Ratko Mladic is called Marko Vladic, you know. Marko Vladic, Ratko Mladic, Marko Vladic. I mean, it's obviously Ratko Mladic. I mean, you cannot say you killed him because you didn't kill him at the time and you did not save us, you know, from all this night being, you know, from the siege. So this scene would really um, strike me on a very personal level because my father was hit in the eye and uh, by another sniper. And that's why it was the entrance, uh, in, uh, interest for this. So then we went to all these like buildings, just to just, I mean, I know we're already 5.30, but I think I can finish in a few minutes. Is that okay? Yes. This Basically, is... you can really finish also really with this point uh, uh, taking us back that we can see each other all, but also saying us about uh, uh, the next project that I'm okay. personally also very so this We went to all these sniping positions of Sado, so we're recording people in with very teleobjectives to see how actually they were seeing us. So this is an image of a small girl which we ran into. So how did they, what was there? Uh, how the snipers could really see uh, the children and kill them as they did. So we went to, to all these buildings where the snipers were positioned and we recorded uh, lots of photos about it. Uh, and then uh, here it was, um, wait a second, there's just two more. 
Ah, oh, okay, the again, the video game is some frames from the video game. Okay, this is the testimony of the Bosnian sniper. So this could be my father. So I found him on YouTube, you know, some, some testimony where he's explaining how hard for him is to shoot the other ones. But he said, but if they don't shoot us, if they, we don't shoot them, they will shoot us, you know. And then he starts to cry. That part I cut off because I really didn't want it to have it so explicit. But it's a, it's, he was the age of my father. He even looks a little bit like him. And I really wanted to have this uh, short, you know. And then there was an unfortunate, um, two more very unfortunate video of a guy who gets shot in the middle of Sarajevo, and then the UN transporter comes and kill him, uh, actually strikes him with the bullet, and then the UN transporter comes and hide him until they get him out. In the end, it appeared to be one of our very friends, very great uh, animator, designer, uh, you know, and everything who was still in the wheelchairs because he was 17, 18 when he got shot. So then this is the position of victim, you know, of the very young guy being shot in the middle of Sarah. And this is my sister, Dan, who is now in the normal Bosnian army, which is not there because we need to defend ourselves, but it's the generation who just is in army and uh, paid the army and went to Afghanistan. It's the American, uh, American uh, um, uh, training she went before she was sent to Afghanistan, and she did that because we she had economic problems, so she thought it was a good solution. I was, of course, against it, but nobody wanted, wanted to listen to me. And... Uh, the new project, you said, no? Yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you um, for sharing, actually, also these images, because this context, uh, I think, uh, uh, works uh, uh, with uh, what is in the show, in the World Museum, because all this is part of this much wider context. Uh, and explains the background. Yes, yeah. the background. Uh, I mean, I'm working on several small projects now, but to tell you honestly, this corona the thing, the, the corona period really made me even less productive because we don't travel. I mean, even for the World Museum, as we said, we were a little bit, nobody could travel. We are still not European Union. We can still feel that this is, a, for Bosnians, it's, it's a little bit hard, but the whole art world is in problems. No? The whole art world now is in crit critical problems, but... Uh, at the moment, I'm trying to make several projects. One, one is like, let's see if we get the money from, it's about very right-wing uh, religious and um, political groups in Bosnia. Um, mostly the hobbies and everybody, but in the experience of their wives went with them to the military, um, to, to fighting in Afghanistan, all these jihad wars, let's say, paid and, you know, right-wing uh, uh, Muslim structures and the violence against women that happens over there when they get out of their passports and the families they take. And so we're working on the scenario for this documentary. Luckily, we'll get some money. There's a small um, photo book that we are creating now for uh, some publisher uh, cooperation, Rome and uh, Bosnia, about... Uh, how to live uh, uh, Sarajevo in the political environment, in a sense that what does it mean, you know, for us now? Because you have um, to leave Sarajevo, not to leave. How did people live in 90s? You know, why did they leave? Uh, how some of them came back when the war started instead of leaving, you know? All about is leaving and coming back to a certain political space, which is, I think, very important also in the in the in the in the having in mind all these like big migrations and everything that is happening you know what does it actually mean to leave the house the nostalgia of coming back home and all these uh, gastarbeiters and everything that we have so it's just actually a small book for a book of the uh Sado environment and some testimonials of friends uh, kind of combined with this and this project which are also don't know, don't go if it's going don't know if it's going to work totally it's just the beginning phase of it about systemic rape together with all these very important organizations uh, from four or five countries that are very serious uh, activists and uh, activist organizations who treat the subject quite seriously. Are we going to have to produce two year, one or two, one and a half years of the project? I'm going to have to work in some kind of, let's say, immersive arts installation, but not in this uh, uh, very expensive production, which will actually... Mm, as the main elements have these uh, spaces of traumas, some certain 
um, known spaces where the systemic rape was happening. So we were going to try not to be, again, explicitly violent, but to go and speak with uh, victims of the wartime rape and to record all these environmental spaces, environments of the where the actual rape was happening, you know, hundreds of women, and try to make somehow something that will make the audience think about it, feel, you know, empathy about it and understand, you know, the 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 the, the, the horrors that were happening, but still not like traumatize them, you know, in a bad way. And try to make uh, some. It's going to be a larger project. One. This is just one part of it. Okay. Uh, I, I I must say thank you so much for sharing all this and also giving us the context. I think uh, we can conclude now. And uh, I give the um, the word. the next uh, word and the the, the lead to Sophie. Uh, which uh, uh, that uh, will actually moderate if it's questions uh, uh, and also your answers. And uh, this is uh, what we prepare for today. So, Sophie? We have questions now, great. Yes, uh, uh, hello also from my side. And uh, thanks a lot, Adela, for your, for your really uh, captivating account of your work and also of your personal experiences. But this was a fantastic uh, introduction, I would say, into your really extensive and impressive work. Congratulations also on everything you've achieved. And um, I, uh, I, I think uh, if there are any questions, there are two ways. You can either raise your hand virtually, <laughs> which I think by now most people know how to do. And otherwise, there is also a chat function. You can write things into our chat. Um, we also appreciate it if you want to make yourself visible. So that's, uh, that's most welcome if anybody feels like joining us by video. Are there any questions to Adela or also um, regarding the show? Now is the time. It's and true. if there are no questions so far, I would also, I could um, share a little bit of information, uh, background information about the exhibition and um, how the exhibition came about well, it wouldn't be very long. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I don't see any uh, uh, in the chat uh, any uh, question posed, not the uh, hand, but uh, uh, I would like also to extend before you go shortly in this uh, uh, wider context uh, my thank. Uh, to uh, Adela uh, in this really uh, important uh, contextualization uh, that is bigger than just what is the work, but understanding, I will say, what is Europe, what was the 90s, what is, uh, from where we are uh, coming and we found uh, uh, us today where we are uh, practically because uh, it's uh, this war was part of uh, Europe and we were formed uh, through uh, this, uh, what was happening uh, in ex-Yugoslavia and uh, uh, also what happened in the last uh, 30 years, uh, I will say. So really thank you also the reflection uh, that was very important about uh, the formats and the experiences uh, and the troubles. I mean, also what means to make an artwork uh, today and uh, uh, the clash uh, and demands by the uh, contemporary art uh, uh, institutional framework. So this, I think, was really um, powerful. And uh, this is why I want to really thank you once again for this. Welcome. And yeah, and I give you now the word, Sophie, to conclude. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, it doesn't seem that there are any questions. So. What I would like to uh, just mention uh, to, to, to give the context of this artist talk is um, that all of this, um, uh, this exhibition is actually the result of a, a research project that has been going on at the Academy of Fine Arts for um, uh, three years now. And um, I only want to point at uh, three publications that we yeah, of course very important ones thank you for all of this this is like really other than i mean i, I don't know if i mentioned but other than 
uh, having a great exhibition and collaborating with you on all these interviews before for preparing for the dialogues of the future. And it's really been a very long and, and very productive project in a sense, also of publications. Very my, I'm very happy that I'm part of it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks also, Adela, for, 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 for being part of it. Um, we've, uh, um, I'll start from the left. Um, we have published a, a, a catalog uh, to the ongoing exhibition that far exceeds the actual exhibition. Of course, it covers works by the artists, um, but uh, there's also theory and, um, and a, lot of, um, a lot of context on the actual traumatic past um, of Europe. Uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, then there is the Dialogues for the Future, which is a collection of interviews that we have conducted in the context of the research project. Uh, many of them in former Yugoslavia, very important first-hand accounts of the genealogy of amnesia, of the genealogy of, uh, of forced forgetting um, that we are trying to counter here with collecting um, uh, these interviews um, that are meant to be, as the title says, Dialogues for the Future. And then uh, uh, our first publication, actually, that came out in the beginning of last year is, uh, is an, 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 an academic uh, anthology called Opposing Colonialism, Antisemitism and Turbo Nationalism, and um, is uh, basically the foundation on which we have uh, developed, uh, conceptually developed um, uh, this show. Um, all of this can be found on our website, uh, Archive of Amnesia at uh, akabild.ac.t. I will quickly switch to a different uh, slide so I can show you the website and then also an announcement for uh, the next talks that we are going to host in the same format. Um, the, can you see the presentation? Partially. <laughs> Partially. No, not really. No, not really. No. And it's coming now. I think... Can you yeah, see you can, no, we see the next artist talks. That exactly. Yeah. Um, the, the, these are the, this is the website again uh, of the research project, archive of amnesia.akabild.at. And also I wanted to point out that uh, we have a lot more digital content uh, in the forms of artist talks um, and videos about the exhibition that you can find under the Weltmuseum Wien website, um, uh, museum from home slash digitale Vorträge. Uh, can easily be accessed by their main site. And uh, our upcoming events are, if I can bring them, here. Um, artist talks with two more artists that are showing works um, uh, in the exhibition. The next one is with uh, Martin Krenn on the 16th of March at 7 p.m. And the third one will be with uh, Elizabeth Bakambamba Tambwe on the 30th of March also at 7 p.m. And we will use the same Zoom channel so you know already where to find us. Okay. So, yeah, so, this, I thank everyone again for uh, making this you. event happen. Uh, thanks especially also to the team from the Weltmuseum Wien for the technical support for uh, preparing and organizing and announcing this uh, online series. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot have a uh, real time guided tours in the museum, um, but uh, we are more than happy to meet virtually and to uh, actually keep the, keep the narrative going online. And I congratulate you everyone for making it happen in the worst times because all of our exhibitions and everything was canceled or postponed and nobody actually except you, the team, uh, Marina, Sophie, everybody there, you managed to really uh, make this project until the end. And I really am happy and congratulations. I'm very happy. That, therefore, I'm very happy to be you. And you can actually see a snippet it cannot, of it can be possible. Me. And uh, maybe, though, I mean, it's possible to see the exhibition. The exhibition is open. So um, uh, everyone is invited it is, to uh, go and see it, uh, just unfortunately without tours. But, uh, I think I might be even able to come and see it in March. That would be really great. Let's, that try, let's see. That would be great. However, thank you once again. Okay. Thank you.